Welcome to the Temple of the Silver Stars public webinar. Uh, my name is Matthew. I'm an academic track instructor in the Temple of the Silver Star. And this is our 10th out of 12 classes in our uh, Paths, Letters, and Correspondences series. So as I was just saying, uh, we're nearing, nearing the end here, getting into our last uh, sets of letters. So uh, yeah, let's, let's just jump right into it. Oops, where are my slides advancing? Here we go. All right, so our first letter for today. Oh, you know, and, and as always, you know, feel free to jump in with if you have any questions or comments or anything like that. Uh, and then at the end, I'm happy to hang out for a few minutes and uh, answer any, you know, additional questions and stuff like that. But, but feel free to type into the chat as we go through. All right, so yeah, we'll start off today with the letter Ayin. Very interesting letter. Um, you'll see, I'll give it to the next slide here. You'll see some variations um, in how this letter name is spelled in English. Um, sometimes you'll see just A-Y-I-N. Sometimes you'll see like kind of A apostrophe A-I-N. So the A apostrophe at the beginning and then the Y are both sort of optional. But you'll never see both absent because usually the word just A-I-N uh, is like Ayin as in nothing. Um, but that's with an Aleph uh, rather than in, uh, the letter Ayin. All right, so uh, Ayin is one of our single letters. And so we know that it will be attributed to one of the signs of the zodiac. Our hieroglyphic origin uh, is possibly from the Egyptian hieroglyph meaning I, and then that likely leads to the, the Phoenician letter that you see there, um, which is basically just a circle meaning I. Um, as I may have noted before, there's a lot of variation in the Phoenician letters, you know, over time and in different regions and all that. And so these are kind of like idealized uh, versions of the Phoenician letters, but more or less a circle. Uh, which is interesting. Well, uh, well, I can, when we do Tav, I'll come back to uh, some of this. Uh, there's some interesting stuff that can be done with some of the shapes of the, the Phoenician letters, and that includes uh, this one here, but we'll talk about that later. So it's sound. Um, now, this one is a little bit confusing, and it's also different in modern Hebrew than it probably was in, in ancient Hebrew. So in ancient Hebrew, it's likely to have been the what's called the voiced uh, pharyngeal uh, fricative, um, uh, or, or something similar. No one, I, I, there, there seems to be some, some uncertainty about it. Um, and now what this sound is, uh, it's voiced, so you're, the vocal cords are being engaged. Um, pharyngeal is sort of like using the, the root of the tongue uh, to narrow, and then in fricative means that you're using like the root of the tongue to narrow the vocal cords. So it's kind of an aw, oh, aw, oh, so it's a kind of back of the throat sound. I, I can't really do it very well. Um, in modern Hebrew, uh, it's often just silent uh, or is sometimes the glottal stop. So in modern Hebrew, it, it makes, it's basically the same as an Aleph, you know, in terms of, of pronunciation, um, being either silent or the glottal stop, but traditionally it would have been uh, distinguished. Now the English equivalent you'll usually see um, is, is a le the letter O. Um, in actual like transliteration, it'll often be an A with the um, the uh, apostrophe there, um, which can often indicate like the glottal stop pronunciation. That's more of a modern thing. Um, o can be a little bit confusing because O is often, uh, or O is also an English equivalent uh, for uh, the letter vowel or vav, where it makes more sen uh, sense because it's closer to being a vowel or ayin. I mean, really none of the Hebrew letters are vowels. Um, so this is a, a slightly complex top thing. Um, but so when you're seeing O's or Ayin's and then transliterating that, um, just, just be careful not to get confused between like transliterations of, of Aleph and, and Vav, um, just sort of pay attention there. But this is a, a kind of confusing one that doesn't have a very obvious or easy uh, English equivalent. But O is the, the most common one that you'll see. All right, so its value is 70. Uh, and spelled in full, it is Ayin Yod Nun. And so this is what I was saying about the, the potential for confusion with the word Ayin, mean, meaning nothing, uh, which is Aleph Yod Nun. Uh, very similar sound. Uh, and that's, of course, you know, like the veils of the negative, the, the, the non-existence that is, you know, the divine nature before any manifestation and all that. But that's not connected to uh, the letter Ayin. All right, so our value spelled in full is 130, you know, 70 plus 10 plus 50, uh, or is 780, uh, which we use the final value of noon as 700 uh, plus 70 plus 10, uh, 780. Uh, both e very interesting numbers. Um, yeah, worth looking into, uh, but I, I don't think anything really needs to be said more here. Um, so its meaning is I, and now this is the one where the actual Hebrew uh, 
you know, ayin, yod, nun as an actual Hebrew word does mean I. So this one nicely matches. Um, and then you also get a lot of uh, derived meanings from I. So from I, you have things like sight, appearance, uh, to look, to seem, uh, a surface, you know, again, like playing to the idea of appearance or how things appear to the eye. Um, all of that is you know, derived meaning from I. And then also pointed differently, uh, the same letters can also mean like a spring um, of water. Um, and some of the stuff about, um, about eyes uh, and about surface and about appearance, um, this will become relevant uh, as, we, as we talk a little further. And we'll see some eye symbolism as well. So all this stuff definitely ties in um, with our like tarot meanings and other things that we'll see as we go along here. All right, so uh, as always, we'll do our 32, uh, you know, our paths of wisdom here. So this is the 26th path. So Westcott, uh, again, I'll give you Westcott's translation, uh, which is the, the one more central to, to the Golden Dawn tradition. And I'll also give you a modern scholarly translation from Kaplan. So Westcott gives, the 26th path is called the renewing intelligence because the holy God renews by it all the changing things which are renewed by the creation of the world. And then Kaplan gives 26, renewing consciousness. It is called this because it is the means through which the Blessed Holy One brings about all new things which are brought into being in his creation. Um, again, this is an interesting one. I think it, it fits maybe not in an incredibly obvious way, but in a deep way, I think it, it fits very nicely with uh, some of the other symbols and meanings. And especially when we look at the tarot card, um, talk about uh, about creation um, and, and renewal uh, and about the process of, of manifestation and return. I think a lot of these are, are relevant symbols here. Um, yeah, so some, just keep it in the back, that, that in the back of your head uh, as, as we go along. All right, here's the path of Ayin uh, on the tree of life. It connects uh, to Fereth, to Hod. And so as I was saying last time, uh, and we'll see again, uh, just below to the, that kind of triangle uh, of paths, just below Tefereth, um, has some of the definitely more difficult or, I, I was thinking about it afterwards. Um, yeah, I think I said maybe dark or difficult last time, um, but you know, we can also think of these things as being like threatening to the ego. And, and as I think I might've mentioned, uh, that makes a lot of sense when we're talking about this as an initiatory structure and moving up on the tree uh, in the approach to Tefereth and you know, the uncovering of, of something like, uh, the deeper self, you know, the, the true self that lies, you know, beyond or within the ego. Um, the ego itself has to, to go through, you know, sort of threatening and, and difficult processes to to let go of, of its sense of being, uh, you know, the, the center and the creator and, and the most important thing um, and all that sort of idea. So we see some of this. Uh, with, the, with the path of Ayin. And it also makes a lot of sense that it was, is, is moving from Hod uh, to Tefereth. You know, Hod is the lowest sphere on the, um, uh, what's called the, the pillar of severity, which is very much about the pillar of form. Uh, and so we're going from form uh, to something that lies beyond form. And we'll see a lot of that as we go along uh, with, especially with the, the Tara Trump um, and the idea of, of matter and of creation and, and also the sort of the theme of, of illusion uh, and, and generation uh, uh, and manifestation. All right, so it's uh, yet seratic attribution uh, is to Capricorn. You'll see a lot of variation in the, the I don't know why, but uh, more than any other, the, the glyphs uh, for the, the zodiac signs, you'll see more variation with the, the, the Capricorn glyph. Um, though usually you'll have something kind of resembling a V with a, a sort of looping uh, shape connected to it. Um, though again, I'm sure you've all seen variations there. Uh, so this is the, yeah, so this is the sign Capricorn, uh, which is the goat. Um, I, I think I mentioned uh, when we first went talked about zodiac signs that it could also be the sea goat. Um, that's really not relevant for our symbolism. Um, just just the goat uh, is, is what's important here. All right, so it's a yin uh, or, or nocturnal sign. It's a cardinal sign uh, and it's an earth sign. So, well, let's see, I'll, I'll just go through. So it's, it's the domicile of Saturn. Um, so Capricorn is ruled by Saturn. This is Saturn's house. And it's also the exaltation of Mars. So I mean, it's not, isn't necessarily particularly martial, um, but Mars is quite at home uh, and, uh, and, and pleased uh, about being in Capricorn. So uh, as always, uh, um, as we've been doing, uh, I'll give you some uh, keywords for, the, um, for this sign. Let me just find my notes here. Okay, so let's see. Um, 
for Capricorn, uh, I, my keywords I've, I've listed here, I've got methodical, careful, structured, organized, strategic, fastidious, skeptical, pessimistic, solid, earthy, negative, dark, old, ancient wisdom, uh, rule focused, um, uh, and, and sort of planning or, or having a kind of master plan um, are all uh, sort of Capricorn related things. Um, and so we, you know, we can see a lot of that is is Saturnian, of course, and this is the uh, one of the two houses of Saturn, uh, and this is Saturn's like Yin, Saturn's night house. So we have Saturn um, at its uh, sort of most passive. Um, so a lot of uh, you know, ideas about restriction, uh, boundaries, rules, and and in a really nice way. I've heard a few different astrologers talk about thinking about the difference between like Capricorn and Aquarius, where they're both Saturn's uh, domiciles. And, you know, Saturn is always about sort of rules and restrictions and structure and organization. Uh, but anyways, the way I've heard astrologers talk about the difference between the two is that in Capricorn, it's about sort of being inside of structure and inside of rules. And then in Aquarius, it's about like being outside of structure and outside of rules. So it's a nice sort of way of, of looking at the two sort of modes uh, of, of Saturn in the, the day and night mode. All right, and so it's a, it's a cardinal sign, which is interesting. Um, you know, the nocturnal and, and Earth and Saturn, a lot of those things may be a little bit different about what, than we normally think of the, the qualities of like a cardinal sign, which is about sort of activating and initiating things. And so the way I like to think about the, why uh, Capricorn is a cardinal sign uh, is that this is about like the, the imposing structure onto something. This is about like, the active role of, of organizing or of setting rules uh, or, or, you know, Im imposing boundaries. Uh, I think because, you know, the cardinal signs, you can think of them as signs that have like a plan uh, or a plan of action, something that they want to accomplish maybe. Uh, and so Capricorn, maybe among other things, you know, wants to accomplish, uh, you know, structuring uh, and, and putting rules to things. All right, so it's magical weapon. Um, Crowley lists two here, uh, the secret force, uh, and then also the lamp. And he doesn't explain either of these, but he does uh, recommend that uh, you compare these magical weapons to uh, the magic weapons of the 20th path, uh, which is Yod uh, and Virgo, you know, and the hermit, where we saw uh, the lamp uh, paired with the staff as the uh, the weapons, you know, of, of the hermit. Um, and then also that idea of, I think he put it as like virile force reserved or something like that. Um, so it's again, the idea of, you know, in the secret force here, um, we can think of it at least preliminarily um, as something like the sex force or the sexual power. Um, and again, there's going to be a lot of that um, uh, as, as we go through here, stuff about generativity um, and also some very specifically like phallic uh, symbols and, and significances. Um, yeah, so, okay, so for tarot, uh, we've got the 15th Atu, uh, which is the devil. Uh, and then also the two, three, and four of discs uh, can be attributed to the three decans of Capricorn. All right, and then for perfume or incense, um, we have musk or civet, um, which are both sort of animal-related um, perfumes. Um, and so, again, so it's th this quality of animality, um, and of, of sort of animal virility um, that we'll see uh, being brought up here. And then also just any Saturnian perfume uh, could also work for Capricorn. That, that As we've seen, that, that's sort of generally true with a lot of the, the zodiacal signs. Um, you can pretty much always get away with using a perfume uh, f with maybe a few exceptions. You can pretty much always get away with, with using a, the perfume of one of, the, of the, the ruling planet since that will convey so much of the, or not convey, but uh, sort of determine so much of the meaning of the signs is, is what planet it's ruled by. All right, and then so for magical powers, uh, we have the Curly of God says the witch's Sabbath so-called. It's interesting to think of the witch's Sabbath as a power, um, but it you know, certainly is a, a kind of magical ritual. Um, the witch's Sabbath makes a lot of sense. Um, and that's, that's a really sort of deep and complex topic, you know, about the Sabbath, about especially getting to things about, you know, what was may have actually been practiced, you know, like in the medieval world, uh, and then what's, you know, just sort of a fantasy of the, the church authorities and how those two things interact over time. Um, so interesting stuff there, but we don't really have time to get into it now. 
Uh, and then we also have uh, the evil eye, which makes a lot of sense. So we saw ayin, uh, you know, means eye. Uh, and, you know, this is also a, one of the more malefic uh, signs, uh, you know, ruled by Saturn and exalted by Mars. And in traditional astrology, you know, Saturn and Mars are the two malefics. Um, so the idea of, of you know, malefic magic uh, connected with the eye makes perfect sense here. All right, pretty dark uh, color scales here. Uh, on our king scale, we've got indigo. Um, so again, this is a, we've just been sort of going through the, the zodiac signs and going through the, the 12 fold division, you know, of the color wheel. And so indigo is our, our color from, you know, in that, in that scheme. Um, Curly also links the color here with the color of Yisod. I mean, the color of Yisod is, is more usually given as violet rather than as indigo, but you're just sort of ignoring that, that slight distinction there. Uh, the, the connection that Crowley is making with Yisod is of the, the genital center. You know, Yisod is a tribute to the genitals. Uh, and so this is getting into some of these ideas about the, the you know, the sexual uh, and generative force. Then in the uh, in the queen scale, uh, we have the color black. Uh, this is you know related to Saturn um, and to Earth. You know Saturn is, is the, the metal lead, uh, and so this black you know dark colors. Then the prince uh, or emperor scale is a just, you know combination of, of our king queen scales. So now you know indigo and black mixed together makes a blue black. And then finally for the princess or empress scale, we have a cold, a cold dark gray approaching black. All right, now we'll look at some of our practical correspondences. So for stones here, we have the black diamond. Uh, now, the black color, you know, we just we just talked about being appropriate to Capricorn. Um, Crowley says that the main reference here um, is to the, the pupil uh, of the eye. So again, talking about eyes, and you know, related to Ayin, makes a lot of sense. Now, interestingly, the black diamond also can be attributed to, to a, well, I think two other places um, on the tree of life. One is to like the veils of the negative, which is sort of strange to attribute a, a stone to the veils of the negative. But if we were, the black diamond makes a lot of sense. You know, diamonds, um, you know, often have the, the, the symbolism of something very high, very like sort of exalted, supernal uh, sort of spirituality. And then the black color, you know, represents the sort of the voidness, that, that, primor that idea of, uh, you know, like the God of negative theology beyond any kind of human conception. And so black, because, you know, we're unable to see or perceive any of its nature. So the ones, the, the extreme like height of deity beyond anything we can understand. And then the black diamond can also be attributed to earth. Um, and so that would be like the lowest thing, the most material. Uh, and so in, in Ayin, I, I feel like we almost have, have both of those things at once, you know, the highest and the lowest together, um, you know, the, the pure sort of Godhead, uh, and then also, uh, you know, the, the material manifestation. A lot of that duality is very appropriate to this letter. So for plants, um, we have the orchis root, uh, which is uh, shown above. Now, orchis, I, I'm not 100% sure, but it's its exactly how it's related. Um, but it's its related to the orchid, um, or it's that some orchids um, are, are, the, are also known as the orchis. Uh, but again, I'm not exactly clear on how that relationship works. Uh, but the main reason for the, the orchis root uh, being attributed here uh, is its appearance. Uh, and we can see that it resembles uh, in a way the, the male genitals. The, the root itself has these uh, kind of bulbs there um, that resemble the testicles. Uh, and then the plant, the erect uh, you know, stalk uh, of the plant itself uh, resembles the penis. And this uh, kind of a way of, of picturing the male genitals, we will see it just in just a moment again with the, uh, the tarot trunk. Uh, we also have uh, Indian hemp, uh, you know, or cannabis. Um, now this is, I think, mainly here because of the quality um, of the fiber. You know, it's, it's fibrous uh, and tough and strong. Um, though the fact that, you know, there's also the intoxicating uh, quality uh, may also be relevant. But I think it's mainly because of the quality of the fiber. Um, as a drug, uh, like, you know, cannabis would not be attributed to, uh, you know, to, to Ayin. I've seen people do it in different ways, but it, attributing to, to, you know, to Capricorn doesn't make a ton of sense for the actual drug, uh, you know, cannabis. Um, also the thistle, you know, because it's hard and, and spiky, uh, sort of an intuitive uh, connection to Saturn there. And then also um, a plant called Yohimba, uh, which is an African, uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a bark. Um, yeah, an African plant um, that was used uh, as an aphrodisiac. 
So again, uh, some of this stuff about uh, you know the, the generative power and sexuality. All right, and then for animals, uh, we have the goat, not surprisingly, you know, through through Capricorn. And I think we can think of this very especially as like the mountain goat, and that's the photo you see there is of a, of a mountain goat. Um, you know, Curly talks about the, the mountain goat, you know, wandering through the, the lonely and desolate places. Um, and that, that sort of desolation makes a lot of sense for Capricorn, you know, for Earth uh, and, and for Saturn. Um, and, uh, you know, Capricorn type people can sometimes be seen uh, or, or sometimes sort of present themselves as people without a lot of needs or, or like emotional needs. Not that they don't have them, but that they can kind of cover them over or maybe even not be aware of them themselves. Um, so there is some idea of, of um, like a barrenness. Um, now, also in the mountain, uh, it's a little bit complex uh, and some of it is stuff that I can't really talk about publicly. Uh, but there is a connection that Crowley makes with Capricorn um, and especially the kind of the goat and the mountain goat uh, and the idea of like the heights. Um, there's a kind of complex way that, although, you know, of course, the sun's entrance into Capricorn uh, in the northern hemisphere as the beginning of winter. Um, Crowley also does some stuff to show how Capricorn can also represent like the highest point in the zodiac. Um, and there's some, yeah, kind of complex stuff that he does with that. Uh, so that's something you can kind of look into or some of you may already be familiar with that idea. Uh, but that's definitely here as well, that the goat is, is an animal that, that scales to the heights. So you have kind of a barrenness, but then also something very high and exalted, uh, which is very appropriate. Um, also the ass and the oyster, uh, and Crowley says that both of those animals uh, were sacred to Priapus, who we are about to see. So here we got some Greek and Roman deities, uh, and uh, that's that's Priapus uh, on top. Um, Priapus is portrayed in, in various ways. Um, he's probably like a, originally an Eastern god. He's sometimes portrayed wearing that that Phrygian cap, uh, which usually shows that he's a god who comes, you know, from from the east. Um, Sometimes he's a god of uh, like gardens, um, and often sort of even like the guardian uh, of gardens. And of you know the kind of the fertility and, and abundance of gardens, uh, and he's always portrayed with a very large uh, and usually uh, erect penis. There, uh, you can see it quite uh, cartoonishly exaggerated there. But this one is also interesting because you can see that he's carrying the caduceus, uh, which is you know normally like the emblem of of Hermes, and so he's kind of assimilated some of the the symbolism of Hermes. And Hermes can sort of be attributed here, um, specifically uh, if he's shown like with an erect penis, or if you're familiar with the idea of the um, the herms, the boundary stones, um, those were all those were always shown uh, uh, with with male genitals attached. So Hermes can kind of take on some of this this phallic quality, um, as can Bacchus, uh, and then we also have Pan, uh, and there's a. a Really nice Roman uh, statue there uh, of, ban of Pan uh, copulating with a female goat. Uh, so again, you know, Pan uh, has you know a lot of these uh, same significances that we were talking about about virile, you know, kind of male uh, sexual potency. Uh, he's also you know sort of half half human or part human, part animal, uh, and it's you know part part goat. Um, interestingly, Pan also. The actual name pan um, doesn't have like the etymological language to the word pan, the Greek word pan meaning all, um, but it comes to be interpreted that way in a kind of like Greek, like folk uh, etymology. And so pan ends up taking on this extra significance um, as the all uh, or as something like total. And we'll see that uh, more as we go along that pan gains this extra kind of quality of being, of representing sort of everything that is. Uh, and then you can, from there you can, do you know different sort of um, readings of how these two different things, what seems to be a kind of you know wild uh, animal force, uh, is also the representation of, of totality, and you can get a lot of the, the deeper sort of meanings out of out of those type lines of thought. All right, for our Egyptian deity, we have Set. Uh, Set is a well, Set's a really interesting deity for a lot of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, no one knows what animal Set. Uh, has the the head of. Uh, this animal is usually just referred to as the set animal. There's been lots of different theories proposed, uh, you know, from the idea that it's simply an imaginary animal, um, that it was possibly an animal that's now extinct. Uh, and there's lots of, you know, non-extinct animals that have been proposed uh, as the origin for this animal, but no one knows, uh, which is very interesting. So you, in the literature, you usually just see this animal referred to as the set, the set animal. 
Uh, interesting, the animal is often shown having a, a forked uh, tail, which is related to that, the was uh, scepter that you see uh, Set carrying there. And you see a lot of other Egyptian deities carrying the scepter as well, that forked prong at the bottom. Uh, Set, yeah, there's a lot of things to say about Set. Um, you know, Set is often a, a kind of god of, of chaos, uh, also represented for, like foreignness um, very much. And it's also the god of the deserts, uh, like the, the red desert, you know, as opposed to the black fertile land uh, close to the Nile. Uh, so again, some of these same sort of ideas of, of, of the, the wilderness um, and of a barrenness um, and of a certain like hostility towards life, uh, certainly not, you know, they're connected to environments that are not easy environments to survive in. Appropriate for Capricorn again, but you know the, the mountain goat is an animal that does survive and even thrive uh, in those environments. All right, so look at our magical hierarchy here. Uh, so this is a zodiac sign, so we'll be following the typical pattern that all of our zodiacal hierarchies have been following. So we're going to have two divine names. The first one is uh, the permutations of the tetragrammaton, the twelve banners of the name, and so this one is He Yod He Vav. And then I've also given for an alternative name is the divine name of Saturn, uh, yod heh vav He Elohim. And then for Bria, we have the Archangel of Capricorn, which is Haniel. Uh, not to be confused with Haniel, the uh, Archangel of Venus, uh, which is spelled differently. The uh, Archangel of Venus is, uh, let's see, that's He Aleph Nun, Yod Aleph Lamed. Uh, so there's an, two extra letters in that name, but they're pronounced fairly similarly. All right, and then uh, for Yetzirah, of course, we've got a lot of different, as we've been talking about, we have many different names. Um, but the two important ones to know here is uh, uh, the angel ruling the house, which is uh, Kasnioya, a little difficult to say there. Uh, and then also Samkiel is the lesser assistant angel uh, in the sign. And then finally, the heaven of Asaya is just the Hebrew name for the constellation Capricorn, and that's Gedi. All right, so before we look at the fifth tarot trump, um, I just wanted to show you these two images here. Uh, yeah, so on the left, um, we see one ver version of the Marseille uh, tarot. This is the Hodorowsky Camoan deck, uh, which is the version of the Marseille deck that I like to use. Uh, and we see the, the, the devil here. The, this representation of the devil, you know, sort of drawn from medieval and, and into Renaissance uh, iconography. And then by Eliphaz Levy uh, takes this image uh, and transforms it into the well-known image of Baphomet. I assume a lot of you are, are already pretty familiar with this image, um, but I just wanted to indicate a couple of things. Um, obviously, the, there's the connection with the goat here, right? That Baphomet is, is goat-headed, uh, has some of the kind of monstrous uh, ideas that we've been talking about here. Um, but it, Baphomet also very much takes on some of the same qualities of Pan as representing the all. And, and Levy kind of specifically constructs Baphomet to represent sort of all polarities. So both, you know, it's female, you can see the, the female breasts, uh, and then also the caduceus uh, kind of rising up from Baphomet's crotch uh, clearly represents the, um, you know, the, the male phallus and the phallic uh, generative power. Uh, we also see, you know, images or um, like kind of scales taken from like fish or reptiles, uh, you know, horns, wings. Uh, so kind of combining uh, different all the different animals, combining male and female, uh, dark and light. Um, the two moons there, they're kind of reversed from the signs that you would expect them to be on. Um, but Levy talks about uh, the, you know, the white moon being the moon of Hesed and then the black moon being the, the moon of Gevara. So we have like kind of mercy and severity, uh, the two pillars on the tree of life. And you can easily attribute uh, Baphomet's like entire body to the, you know, to the different Sephiroth on the Tree of Life too. So a very complete and total image, but also a kind of horrifying one. Um, and you know, I think we, it's easy to connect this idea to some of Crowley's ideas about uh, sort of accepting all things, and even kind of especially searching out those things that horrify uh, and disgust us, and to sort of incorporate those things into our world so that uh, our, our you know, picture of the universe or our relationship to the universe is total and not lacking anything. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot more that we could be said. I'd actually maybe like to do an entire class about uh, Baphomet at some point because there's so much to be said. Levy connects Baphomet to the, his idea of the astral light, which is a very innovative magical idea. Um, but yeah, we don't, yeah, we just don't have time to go into it now. Interestingly, for Crowley, Baphomet is less appropriate to um, 
to Ayin uh, and to Capricorn. Um, and Crowley tends to think of Baphomet more associated with Aleph, um, which is interesting. I hadn't really realized that until until recently, um, that he really thinks of Baphomet as, as more of an Aleph uh, image and you know, related to the fool um, than to Capricorn, which is an interesting thing to meditate about, about why Crowley might make that move when it doesn't seem obvious. But when this is Crowley's devil card here, uh, he doesn't include, despite Baphomet being a very important symbol for Crowley, uh, Crowley even adopts the name Baphomet. Um, for one of his offices, like when in, in uh, the OTO. Um, so Baphomet is very important to Crowley, but he doesn't include the Baphomet image uh, in his version uh, of the devil card. All right, so this, yeah, so this is the devil that we're seeing here from the Thoth deck, uh, esoteric title, the Lords of the Gates of Matter, the Child of the Forces of Time. Uh, now this idea of the, the child of the forces of time, and uh, this definitely reminds us of Saturn, right? You know, Saturn, uh, Kronos, the god of time. And this idea about the lords of the gates of matter. Uh, again, we have this idea of, um, well, the, the devil in general, I think this devil in particular, like from the Marseille deck, uh, the way that the devil is often read and interpreted uh, is as an image of kind of like the illusions of the material world, uh, the like the illusion that matter is the only thing that exists or that matter is the primary thing that exists. So this idea of the lords at the gates of matter, and there's an illusory quality here. And you know, that's appropriate to Saturn as well. Saturn uh, is often linked to, to deception uh, and to lies. Uh, and so that, especially in traditional astrology, so that makes a lot of sense here as well. Um, but, it's, it's not simply a negative card. It's not simply like an illusion that we need to transcend or overcome, which is sometimes the, the interpretation that you'll see in maybe more like traditional Golden Dawn sources is that this simply represents an obstacle or something to be overcome. But for Crowley, it's a lot more than that. Uh, and I think it's the, the, the generative potency uh, and the creative power here that I think distinguishes like a thelemic reading uh, of this card from uh, maybe a more traditional Golden Dawn reading. All right, so we'll look at some of the basic symbolism of the card here. Uh, now, as I said, uh, we've got the basically a very large image of the male genitals here. Uh, you see the, the two testicles uh, at the bottom and then the main shaft of the penis uh, rising up towards the top of the card there. Uh, the ring uh, around, the, um, around the shaft there, uh, it always reminds me of, of kind of Saturn's, you know, rings or something like that, maybe. Um, but I think we can also think of it as, as Nuit, um, you know, the, the, the zero, the infinite, uh, the all, um, that this, you know, there's a lot of images of in Crowley of a kind of aspiration and magic being this, uh, you know, almost kind of like phallic reaching out towards the, the feminine all. That's a, a very common symbol um, in, in Crowley's work. Um, yeah, let's see. So in the um, in the we can see like in the in the two testicles there, um, we see uh, figures, you know, female figures on the left side, and and male figures on the right, uh, and we also see the process of um, the you know division of cells and the the replication um, of the uh, uh, like uh, of of the genome there. So in, incorporating this sort of scientific imagery about the actual uh, you know like the the actual scientific process of of human uh, reproduction. All right, uh, now the staff that's kind of rising up um, from the bottom of the card and then sort of ending in the, the winged uh, sun disc in the center there, uh, that's a staff from the Golden Dawn uh, tradition, the staff of the chief adept, I think that would have been. Uh, again, representing uh, the creative potency uh, in its, you know, in, in one of its highest, uh, in one of its highest manifestations. And of course, the wand also always has that, that phallic significance. And we see the goat here. Uh, uh, yeah, a bunch of things to say about the goat. Uh, the horns there have obviously been kind of exaggerated and, and, and given this like spiraling form. As I think I mentioned once already in this class, um, the idea of spirals are very important for Crowley. And he often quotes that line from the Chaldean oracles about, you know, God is he having the head of a hawk, uh, having, a, having a spiral force. Uh, this idea of the, the divinity or God uh, expressing itself in a kind of spiral way or a, the force being of a spiral form uh, is, is, is really important for Crowley. And it's an interesting thing to kind of to, to meditate on and, and think about and think about other meanings of the spiral. Now around the goat's head, or kind of, you know, around the, the horn sitting on top of the goat's head there, um, we see grapes. And so this can remind us, of course, of Bacchus. Uh, 
uh, and the ideas of you know like drunkenness uh, and ecstasy. Uh, and so this is bringing in some of these, I think, interpretations uh, or layers of meaning that go beyond like the tradition, the, the golden dawn idea of this simply as a kind of the illusion of of, of evil or something like that, um, to a real uh, you know a creative potency that that the generative force, uh, but in its most material form, not necessarily like the. Um, uh, like the, the force that would have like created the universe, but like the sexual power, you know, resident in, uh, you know, animals and plants and, you know, humans and, and all of that. Um, but the kind of, so kind of material uh, creative power. All right, uh, let's see, yeah, we're running a little over time here, so I'm just gonna go on, but yeah, this is a really interesting topic and I think these symbols are a really good one to, to sit with, especially the, the ones that seem the most sort of opposite or incompatible. I think the more that you can see the unity behind those different symbols and significances, the more you'll be able to get to some of the, um, uh, yeah, the more uh, esoteric uh, sort of understanding of, of, uh, of this card and of this path. All right, so let's just move on here um, so we don't go too late today. Uh, this is our letter pay. All right, so pay has a uh, final form. You see the, the you know, non-final standard form of pay there on the right, uh, and then the final form on the left. So pay is one of our double letters, so we know it's going to be attributed to a planet. Now its hieroglyph uh, is possibly from the Egyptian hieroglyph for mouth um, that you see there, and then that probably uh, gives rise to the, the Phoenician letter that you see there, which may have meant either mouth or corner. Uh, I, it seems to be not really clear. All right, now as a double letter, we know it's gonna have two sounds. Uh, so it has a hard, and I didn't indicate the hard and soft, but it's, it's pretty obvious. Um, the P, excuse me, the, the P sound is the hard sound, and then like the PH or F is the soft sound. And then its English equivalent uh, is P, or you know sometimes in like transliteration it'll get rendered as like PH, but uh, generally P. Its value is eighty, uh, or in its final form it can also have the value of eight hundred. So easy this is a nice easy one to remember eighty or eight hundred. Uh, you know just just add a zero to the end. Just, and then spelled in full, um, it's spelled pay hey, pay hey, uh, and that has a value of eighty five. Now, pay, um, yeah, 85 is a few interesting meanings that are, are worth looking into. Um, yeah. Now, again, this is another one where the, the Hebrew letter, this the, the word pay, hey, uh, is actually a, a Hebrew word uh, meaning mouth. Uh, and then it also has a bunch of uh, derived meanings from that, like command, you know, uh, um, also things like speech and word, you know, those are obviously all from the same, uh, you know, kind of idea about, you know, the speech, you know, and words being what, or commands being what, like, issues from your mouth. Um, and then it also has the, the kind of meanings like edge or, or opening, um, which is like, you know, we say the mouth of something, like the mouth of a river or something like that. It's, you know, like the edge or, or the opening, the, you know, the rim of something uh, is, is like the mouth. Uh, in particular, uh, there's a, in kind of medieval and, and Renaissance uh, Christian art, you'll see the idea of like a hell mouth, uh, this kind of mouth of, or jaws of like a creature that swallows you, uh, you know, and, and then brings you down into hell. Uh, and that's a symbol that we will see uh, in the tarot card, though used in a very different way from the way that, you know, the, the Christians use it. But again, it has some of that, that same idea of mouth. And you can see in the, the shape of the letter, uh, this idea of, of the mouth, uh, it's basically, the, the letter is basically the same as, not in its final form, but in the, the standard form there, it's basically the same as the letter cough, uh, just with this extra little thing uh, in the middle. And so we can think of that as like the tongue. Um, so the, the main shape is like the open mouth, uh, and then we've got the tongue there in the middle. All right, so we'll do our path of wisdom here. This is the 27th path. So Westcott says the 27th path is the active or exciting intelligence, and it is so called because through it, every existent being receives its spirit and motion. And then Kaplan gives 27, palpable consciousness. It is called this because the consciousness of all things created under the entire upper sphere, as well as their sensations, were created through it. Now, Westcott's translation, I think, is especially uh, matches are our, our what's going to be our Yetzirah attribution, we'll see in a moment, to Mars. Uh, you know, this idea of active or exciting intelligence, you know, very, very sort of martial. Uh, and then also the idea of, of things receiving their motion uh, through 
through this path. Um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. All right, so here is the path of pay uh, on the tree of life. Um, the, the final path in this sort of trying, the it's kind of, uh, uh, you know, dark or, or threatening, uh, kind of or challenging, uh, like triad there that we saw of, uh, you know, of noon, ayin, and now pay. Uh, it's the last, the third of our reciprocal paths. Reciprocal paths means they're, you know, horizontal on the tree of life. And as I think I pointed out again, there's a couple of, or several interesting patterns that we can see. Um, one is that the highest reciprocal path is attributed to Venus. The lowest reciprocal path, pay, uh, is attributed to Mars. So you're right, you've got Mars and Venus, you know, kind of the male and female powers. Uh, and then the central reciprocal path there, connecting Gevra to Hesed, um, is Teth, right, attributed to lust in the, in the tarot, uh, you know, which shows Babylon and the beast united. So we have the idea of, of Mars and Venus uh, and then their union. Which works very nicely. Um, yeah, and there's some interesting stuff to, to talk about uh, about why it connects like sort of Hode to Netzach. You know, Hode is is as I think I yeah I mentioned just a few minutes ago uh, is related to the idea of form uh, and the idea of forms, uh, also to the intellect. You know, the human the human mind, the human intellect. And then Netzach is very much a fiery sphere of, of devotion and passion and energy. Uh, and so we can imagine one way of thinking about it is, is that sort of fiery energy of Netzach uh, sort of impinging on the, the forms or ideas of Hod uh, to either destroy them if they are in need of destruction or renew them or energize them. Um, yeah, so interesting stuff to contemplate there. <clears throat> All right, and then as I said, uh, for our Yetzeratic uh, attribution, we have the planet Mars. I already, already talked a little bit about the meaning of the planet Mars. Um, one thing to be aware is to distinguish between some of our more esoteric um, meanings of Mars uh, and like astrological meanings. And then also, of course, to distinguish between more traditional and modern uh, uh, you know, significances of, of astrological Mars. Uh, whereas, you know, in traditional astrology, Mars is uh, very much the planet of, um, you know, of separation or of severance, uh, you know, of, of strife, uh, you know, or even kind of like antagonism. Um, in modern uh, astrology and also kind of esoterically, uh, we also get Significance is about like energy and vitality, uh, you know, certainly, you know, in both ancient and modern, you know, strength and power uh, makes sense. Um, but some of these ideas of, about energy and vitality uh, and maybe even like male or and then necessarily just male sexuality, um, but but often, you know, especially if, if, if sort of paired with Venus, you get kind of like what we might think of as like archetypal uh, sort of male or female sexuality. Um, though again, that shouldn't be taken as any kind of like normative statement about how, you know, actual men or women, uh, you know, uh, or, or any other, um, you know, non-binary non -binary individuals uh, express their, their sexuality. We're talking about archetypes and, and you know, traditional understandings here. Um, yeah, I don't know, maybe we'll, we'll, maybe we'll come back to that, like as we look at the, the tarot card or something. Uh, all right, so for our magical weapon, we have the sword. Uh, sword is the, the weapon of Mars. Um, yeah, well, I'll say a little more about that in a minute, but yeah, just sort of pretty pretty straightforward, especially some, looking at some of these traditional ideas about Mars as like severance and separation. That Mars really pairs nicely with Venus there. Venus is very much about bringing things together and harmonizing things, uniting things, or even like kind of the bonds of like love uh, and things like that that bring together. And then Mars like separates and brings apart or creates antagonism rather than harmony. And so the sword uh, as the weapon of division makes sense there. We should be careful not to confuse the sword here um, with like the air sword or the air dagger. This is very much uh, like the, the Mars uh, sword. And as such, I, I don't want to get into it today because it, it's complicated, but the idea of the flaming sword uh, or the lightning flash, which is about the an image of the manifestation of the Sephiroth, um, that can also be connected to Mars uh, and to, to the magical weapon here. Um, but yeah, I don't want to get into that too far because I'll get into a whole conversation about the Sephiroth. All right, in the tarot, uh, we have a 216, the tarot, which in like in the, the Marseille deck, it's called Le, Le Maison Dieu, uh, the house of God. Um, that 
title is not super relevant, but it does appear uh, in the book of the law. Um, the line that he, my prophet, hath chosen, knowing the law of the fortress and the great mystery of the house of God. Uh, Crowley interpreted, and uh, I think everyone else has as well, uh, the, that reference to the, the house of God uh, as a reference to the, 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 the card, the, the tower, through its, you know, its French name as Le Maison Dieu. All right, and then for perfume or incense, um, we have pepper, which makes a lot of intuitive sense. You know, pepper is sharp and hot, you know, spicy, um, and you know, it can even be painful uh, if you if you get too much of it or if you, if you don't like it, uh, or even if you do like it. Um, also, dragon's blood. Uh, dragon's blood is the resin of. There's a, a bunch of different plants um, whose resin has all been described as dragon's blood, and I guess especially like historically, there's a lot of confusion about you know, what people have been calling dragon's blood at different times. Um, but whatever it is, uh, it, it's usually the resin, like powdered, is, is a very brilliant red color, uh, appropriate to Mars. Um, and it's scent, uh, although I'm sure it varies depending on what plant it's actually being, you know, taken from. Um, but its scent is often kind of like hot or um, has a, a martial quality to it. Um, also all hot or pungent odors. And then I also added tobacco. Crowley gives tobacco as a, an incense for, for Gevera, you know, the sphere of Mars. But uh, I think it's also, you know, could be used as a general um, Mars, uh, you know, incense. Though, you know, you may not want to burn tobacco uh, if, you're not a, if you're not a smoker. I don't want to inhale that. Um, all right, so for magical powers, uh, Crowley gives works of wrath and vengeance. Uh, Pretty obvious, you know, in the in the attribution to Mars. Now, for metal, we have iron. Um, iron, right? I mean, iron, of course, is, is connected to like you know the sword. You know, right? Swords, you know, were, were made of iron uh, or iron alloys. You know, like steel. Um, so we have some of that, you know, kind of martial uh, quality uh, right right in the metal itself. And also, um, uh, rust, you know, iron oxide, uh, also has a red color to it as well, which will be uh, relevant when we look at the, uh, the color scales, which is right now. <laughs> right, so the, the red of iron oxide uh, definitely is, is relevant here. Um, now, of course, it, it's, we see a lot, of, a lot of reds here, and the most obvious reason for this is just literally the, the visual appearance of the planet Mars itself. Uh, it's, it's quite red um, in color. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty obvious. And I think, you know, the associations of red, you know, with, with fire and, and with blood, uh, you know, with intensity, that, that's all extremely appropriate. And this is one of the most, of all the color, the planets that I've seen, uh, this is one of the most consistent. Like everyone gives Mars, uh, the, you know, the color red, as far as I can, as, you know, as far as I've seen really. Um, so yeah, slightly different sort of shades uh, of red here. For our King's Kill color, we have Scarlet, which is like slightly orange uh, of a pure red. Interestingly, Crowley seems to confuse uh, Scarlet and Crimson. I don't know if anyone else has ever noticed that. Uh, but yeah, he, something Crowley something seems to be confused about what Scarlet and what Crimson are. You know, Crimson is like red, but slightly towards purple, and Scarlet is red, but like slightly towards orange. Though again, Crowley seems to mix them up sometimes. And for a queen scale, we just have a pure red. Then for our prince scale, we have a Venetian red, uh, which is a slightly duller uh, and desaturated red. And then for our princess scale, we have an interesting thing here. We have bright red. And then like all the double letters, all the uh, letters associated with planets, um, we have raying. But this one actually gives two, like an, an alternative. So it can be rayed either azure or emerald, uh, which, is, which is very interesting. Um, let's see, I probably make some comment about that and I'm blanking on what it is, but uh, yeah, you can look, you can look that up in the notes to 777. Um, but yeah, the main thing to get here is just the, uh, the predominance of red. All right, so for stones, uh, we have the ruby, uh, and this is simply for its color. Now, I, I used a raw, I, I, I tried to find images of the raw stones rather than worked ones. They just sort of appeal to me more. Um, but you will notice that like raw rubies are often a little bit more of a, a duller, like pinkish, or even sometimes like a purple color, whereas cut rubies tend to look more pure red. Uh, and then also all red stones uh, can be attributed here as well. For plants, um, we have wormwood, and that's that's wormwood, that's common wormwood uh, that you see there. 
Uh, and then also Rue. I was a little unclear on why Curly just says both of them are traditional. I was a little unclear on why Rue was being attributed here, though uh, I've been told by uh, an herbalist I trust that uh, Rue is, is fairly similar to Wormwood. Um, and Wormwood definitely does make sense. Uh, Wormwood. Oh, actually, you know what? I, uh, I wrote Wormwood here. Crowley in 777 actually writes absinthe uh, rather than, than Wormwood. Um, and absinthe is a drink, right? Um, but the common Wormwood is uh, was Ar Artemisia ab ab absinthium, uh, I think is, is the Latin name. Uh, so the, the drink absinthe gets its name through like the Latin name for the plant that we call Wormwood. Um, now, about Wormwood being attributed to Mars, I just wanted to read, um, this is from uh, uh, William Culpepper, the English uh, herbalist and astrologer, from his uh, Complete Herbal, uh, in his entry on, um, on, on Wormwood, he talks about why Wormwood is attributed to Mars. It's also kind of amusing, too. Culpepper can be witty. So I'll just read you um, just a little bit here from, from Culpepper. Uh, let's see, he says, Will you give me leave to be critical a little? I must take leave. Wormwood is an herb of Mars, and if Pontanus says otherwise, he is beside the bridge. I prove it thus. What delights in martial places is a martial herb, but Wormwood delights in martial places. For about forges and ironworks, you may gather a cartload of it. Ergo, it is a martial herb. It is hot and dry in the first degree, viz, just as hot as your blood and no hotter. It remedies the evils collar can inflict on the body uh, by sympathy. Um, now, collar or uh, like choleric um, that's associated with Mars and with the qualities of like heat and dryness in uh, you know traditional uh, in tr you know, pre-modern medicine. Uh, he says uh, it helps the evils Venus and the wanton boy produce uh, by antipathy, and it doth something else besides. It cleanses the body of collar. Who dares say Mars doth no good? It provokes urines uh, or sw uh, helps swelling in the belly. It causes appetite to meet because Mars rules the attractive faculty in man. The sun never shone upon a better herb for the yellow jaundice than this. Why should men cry out so much upon Mars for an unfortunate or sadden either? Did God make creatures to do the creation of mischief? This herb testifies that Mars is willing to cure all diseases he causes. The truth is, Mars loves no cowards, nor Saturn fools, nor I neither. Um, so anyways, this is that sort of taste of, of culture. I love that last line about, you know, Mars loves no fool. Uh, wait, Mars loves no cowards and Saturn no fools, nor I neither. And it's great. But it's sort of, you can see some of the logic about why, you know, it's being attributed to Mars, you know, and, and even the idea that in its martial quality, it can both heal some of the ills that Mars causes and also balance out like the ills that like Venus um, uh, might cause or Mercury. So I assume when he says the wanton boy there, uh, he's, he's referring to Mercury. Uh, but yeah, anyways, you know, let's just move on. Uh, anyway, I think like the bitterness of Wormwood too, you know, is very appropriate for Mars. All right, so for animals, we have the wolf, uh, and that statue you see there is a statue of a wolf, uh, and the two uh, children there suckling from the wolf are Romulus and Remus, who are sons of Mars, and then also the mythical founders of Rome. Um, and they are, they were, you know, sort of raised uh, and by a, a she-wolf. So these children of Mars raised by a wolf, uh, that's how we get wolf there. And of course, you know, wolves make a kind of intuitive sense for Mars. I think we, we also saw wolves uh, uh, attributed to Scorpio, you know, the night house of Mars, you know, and wolves are nocturnal creatures. Um, also the horse, uh, I think Crilly just says because of its spirited nature, you know, because it's, it's active, uh, you know, vast, I guess. Um, Crilly lists the, this is a really interesting one, Crilly lists the bear and says that the bear is attributed here because of its all chemical uh, qualities or alchemical properties, um, but I'm not, I'm not clear on what the meaning of the bear uh, in alchemy is. So if anybody knows or has any ideas, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Um, but yeah, somehow through alchemy, Crowley makes a connection to the bear. Uh, and then also the boar, um, sp especially in the myth of Adonis, uh, where the boar uh, you know, kills Adonis. Uh, Crowley connects that to, to a martial uh, quality. All right, so for our Greek or Roman deity, we have the Greek Ares uh, or the Roman Mars. 
Now, interestingly, the Aries and Mars are actually fairly different. They're both, you know, martial gods. They're both war gods, um, but they're quite different in their character. Um, Aries is really a, a pretty negative, unpleasant figure. Um, you know, he can be violent and, and brutal and aggressive, um, but he's also a coward. Uh, he's ugly. He's He doesn't really have any kind of strategy. Um, Aries is, is a pretty unpleasant uh, figure, whereas the Roman Mars uh, is much more of a, like a, a general in war. Um, he's more organized, more strategic, more civilized. Um, yeah. So, Although, you know, we often talk about Aries and Mars as being you know, kind of the Greek and Roman names for the same basic deity, they're really not, or they, they, there's a real distinction, I think, to be made. Uh, and so it's, it's really, I think, the Roman Mars that's, that's more appropriate here. So it's, you know, helpful to keep in mind some of the Greek ideas about Aries as well. Um, but yeah, really just here as, as, you know, as war gods and obviously the connection to the planet Mars. And for our Egyptian deity, uh, we have Horus, uh, depicted here in one of his forms, uh, wearing the double crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. Uh, I assume most people here are at least vaguely familiar with Horus. Uh, one, there's other Egyptian uh, martial, you know, war gods as well. The Horus is the most prominent. Uh, Horus is the the child of, of Isis and Osiris. Um, and then, you know, of course, Horus takes on a, a very particular, very central significance um, in Thelema, uh, especially where Horus is, um, uh, you know, combined with with Ra as Ra Hor in the various forms of, of Ra Hor. Um, yeah. All right. So let's look at our magical hierarchy for Mars here. Uh, so planetary hierarchy, a little more straightforward than the zodiacal ones. Uh, so we've got the divine name of Mars, Elohim Gibor, and that name is most especially the divine name attributed to Gevra, but Gevra is the sphere of Mars, so it's also the divine name of Mars. Then for Bria, we have the Archangel of Mars, which is Kamael. Excuse me. <clears throat> and then for Yetzra, we've got a trinity, um, or you know, three levels here of our hierarchy. We've got the planetary angel, Zamael, the planetary intelligence, Graphael, and the planetary spirit, Bartzabel. Some of you may, even if you haven't like studied the hierarchies, might be uh, familiar with the spirit of Mars, uh, Bartzabel. Uh, Crowley wrote a very long, detailed, uh, and, and really elaborate uh, ritual for invoking uh, Bartzabel, the, the spirit of Mars. Um, and so, yeah, if you're interested in a model for a really kind of elaborate, uh, uh, involved model that involves like a number, se several ritual officers uh, for, for a Mars ritual, you can check out Crowley's um, uh, you know, the, I forget exactly what it's called, but you know, the ritual to, to invoke parts of All right, and then we've also got our Heaven of Asaya, uh, which is the, the Hebrew name uh, for the planet Mars, uh, which is Madim. Also, you know, I, in this, I, I meant to mention this a minute ago, um, in this font, uh, the glyph of Mars, the arrow is sort of pointing straight up. More commonly, you'll see it a little bit like angled off to the side. I'm not sure why. Uh, but, you know, there's, again, there's just some variation in it. Uh, if you've seen any of the older glyphs of Mars, uh, like from the kind of medieval uh, or traditions, uh, this is a, the, this version that can straight up right is a little bit closer to uh, some of the older versions of the Mars glyph. All right, and then uh, let's just spend a couple minutes here talking about the Tower Trump. So this is Atu 16, the tower, whose esoteric title is the Lord of the Hosts of the Mighty. So uh, yeah, really great card here. I think this is a really, really nice um, showcase of, uh, of you know, Frida Harris's art uh, style. And one that I found, um, uh, you know, if you're only familiar with the US games version, um, I, some of the detail, like especially in the, in the tower itself and in the kind of structures behind it, some of that I, I found to be a little lost in the way that they kind of oversaturate the colors. Um, but I, yeah, I, I really like here, I think you get a lot of the sort of detail and texture. Um, yeah, there's something really powerful about it. Some of the, the the style of this card really reminds me of like German Expressionism. Uh, if you're familiar with like German Expressionist art from the early 20th century, um, yeah, really, yeah, kind of powerful, uh, expressive. I mean, the the dynamism uh, and dynamic of it is is very sort of immediately obvious. Uh, and obviously, you see the tower there uh, over on the left, uh, kind of in the center, and you see these figures uh, like tumbling out of the tower. And Crowley's done them as these kind of geometric uh, figures, uh, which is a very interesting thing. You know, not, they're not done as, as like naturalized figures. 
Uh, and there's some very complex stuff about the figures and even the poses that they're in uh, that you can check out in, in the Book of Thoth. We also see uh, a dove and a serpent there. And this is a reference to the Book of the Law about, you know, there is love and love, there is the dove and there is the serpent. Uh, and, you know, and that's actually the line that I was quoting just a minute ago about this is the same line about, you know, he, my prophet, hath chosen knowing the law of the fortress and the great mystery of the house of God. That whole section there is uh, related to this card. Um, and yeah, you can, you can look into Crowley and also just sort of meditate on those lines in the book of the law about the symbolism of the dove and the serpent. I don't want to, um, you know, like front load your own meditations and, and investigation into that. And we see the eye here. And I, I think what makes most sense is to think of this as like the eye of Shiva, uh, the eye that, uh, you know, of, of both creation and destruction. Uh, and we can see kind of the lightning flash, uh, sort of flashing downwards through the eye and, and destroying the tower. You know, the tower is like the, it's also sometimes called like the, the lightning struck tower. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the tower that's being uh, destroyed by the action of God or the divine or whatever. Uh, and then at the bottom here, we see one of these hell mouths uh, that I was referring to earlier, this, this open mouth, uh, you know, in the bottom right, uh, but rather, Again, this isn't like an image of the, the Christian hell or anything like that, but just using some of this iconography. Uh, um, it, but it's, it, it's sort of like belching flames here that are uh, helping to destroy the tower. So we have a kind of destructive force coming from above and from below, which is very interesting. Uh, let's see, we've got a comment from Christopher here. Uh, he says, in North mytho mythology, bears were symbols of strength and primal force. Berserkers wore the skin of bears uh, when in war trances. Oh, yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, I didn't, I didn't know about the berserkers wearing uh, bear skins. That's, that's a really great, um, uh, yeah, kind of mythological archetypal connection. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, the way that berserkers fight, yeah, is a very kind of <laughs> martial, uh, and all warriors, of course, are martial. Um, but in particular, that, that way of fighting makes a lot of sense for, for Mars. So that's great. Um, all right, yeah, let's just, uh, let's just move along here. All right, so our third and last letter uh, for the day will be Zadi. All right, Zadi, uh, another letter with a final form. Um, I didn't really say anything about the final form of pay, uh, I guess, a minute ago, but it's, it's basically the same as, as an old pay, uh, just with the, the bottom line kind of extended down. Um, well, I'll just flip back so you can see it for a second. Yeah, so basically the same form. And that's, that's very similar to like, you know, the, the way that cough uh, is, is transformed. We see that same sort of uh, transformation idea happening here, uh, where the you know the kind of bottom bar of the letter just gets kind of straightened out, and then it, it uh, descends below the line. Um, all right, so Zadi is one of our single letters, um, so we know that it will be attributed to uh, to one of the signs of the zodiac. Uh, I was just, sorry, I was thinking of something else, but I'll, I'll save it for a minute. Uh, okay, our hieroglyph. Now, this one was particularly confusing and I, I think uncertain. Um, it's possibly from an Egyptian hieroglyph, maybe the one that you see there, um, meaning plant, and possibly like the papyrus plant in particular, though I, that, that is pretty unclear. And then that, some Egyptian hieroglyph gives rise to the Phoenician letter that you see there, uh, which may have meant plant again, uh, or it may also have meant fish hook. Now, it's uh, the sound is what's called the voiceless uh, uh, alveolar uh, affricate. Um, basically, this is like the uh, like a TS uh, sound. So the idea of voiceless, like, you know, the vocal cords aren't being engaged. Uh, and the idea of the, the affricate, here, the alveolar uh, ridge is sort of just behind the teeth uh, in the top of your mouth. It's the place where you put the, the tip of your tongue when you make like a T sound just behind your, your upper teeth. Uh, so it's being made there. Uh, but it's, uh, it's got the, the T sound, like the stop or plosive sound, uh, and then turning into a, like a fricative S. So it's a t -s, uh, sound, like a TS, or a, a, usually the English equivalent would be like TZ. Uh, and we see this also in, um, like in Russian, uh, in the, the Russian czar or czar. Uh, and Crowley actually makes this etymological argument uh, about this sound, you know, being connected to czar, um, and some other words as well, which all sort of mean emperor, and we'll see the, the tarot card, the emperor. Uh, so Crowley actually makes this like uh, etymological, uh, uh, sort of like linguistic argument um, for the attribution of, of Zadi uh, to the emperor. 
because of course this is you know the, the hey zaddy switch uh we've already looked at hey now we're looking at, at uh, the other letter involved in that process so everything you'll see here on this screen this all gets attributed to zaddy uh regardless of what um you know, like zodiac sign zaddy is being attributed to so one of the ways that we can think about you know whether or not the hey zaddy switch you know makes sense to us is to think you know does this stuff here fit better with aries uh or with aquarius you know, does it fit better with the emperor uh, or the star you know, in the tarot? All right, so its value is 90 uh, or 900. Uh, then the value of 90, I think, is, is a one place that we can look into uh, some of this stuff about the hey zadi switch. Uh, when we come to the emperor, we'll see the, the image of the square and the cube uh, as important images related to the emperor. Uh, and also the number four we'll see. Uh, and 90 is like the number of degrees in each angle in a square. Um, so that, that's part of like an argument here about Zadi being appropriate to Aries, uh, is that you have this image of the square uh, and the, the number four, the Atu number of emperor, and then 90 as like the number of degrees uh, in each angle of a square. All right, so spelled in full, you have Zadi uh, Dalef Yod, which sums to 104. Now, Zadi Dalef Yod is not uh, a Hebrew word. Zadi Dalef um, can mean like side, like the side of something. Uh, and I think like in certain forms, it can get spelled as Zalef, Zadi Dalef Yod, you know, like because Hebrew like suffixes and even like prepositions get like attached to words. Um, but Zadi Dalef Yod is not like a normal Hebrew word. Uh, and so its meaning here is fish hook is coming through the, you know, just its, its association with the, the Phoenician letter. Uh, but this isn't like the normal Hebrew word for, for fish hook. Um, now you can possibly see the actual sign of the, the fish, you know, the, the, um, like the shape of a fish hook in the letter, possibly, like in its kind of bent or like hooked um, shape. And that, that meaning of fish hook is, um, well, let's see, let's look at it. I'll, I'll come back to it in a minute. Uh, Curly uses that symbol like a, a few times, uh, the, the idea of the fish hook uh, connected to Zadi. All right, so let's look at the path of wisdom though first. Uh, so we, here we're at the 28th path. And so Westcott gives the 28th path is called the natural intelligence. By it is completed and perfected the nature of all that exists beneath the sun. And Kaplan gives 28, natural consciousness. It is called this because the nature of all that exists under the sphere of the sun was completed through it. Um, so some of this idea of like completion and the completed nature of things, I think has a type of connection to some of the, the meanings of Zadi. It's maybe not one of the more obvious ones, uh, but I think, yeah, hopefully we'll see that uh, as we go through. All right, so here's uh, Zadi on the Tree of Life, and you can see we're really working our way down towards the, the bottom of the tree now. Uh, and here, I think we can see some of the possible ways of, of thinking about the, the symbolism of the, the fish hook. Uh, so in Yusod, uh, you know, Yusod, you know, we've already talked about it being attributed to like the genital center and having, uh, you know, the powers of the, um, you know, the kind of animal or, or sort of generative force, um, uh, uh, you know, of the, of the, the sexual power. Uh, and then the idea of like the, the fish hook uh, as something that sort of hooks onto something and lifts it up uh, out of the depths. Uh, and so the idea of Zadi is often um, sometimes attributed or, or connected to like meditation um, or to like to Raja yoga. And so the idea of like the uplifting uh, of the well, the sex force is also often talked about as the Mars uh, force um, in, in esoteric literature. Uh, and so there can be a kind of idea here of like the uplifting uh, of the Mars force uh, through, you know, the, the fish hook that raises that up from its purely genital expression uh, to like to higher, to higher centers. Um, and that's in no way to degrade or to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to make light or, not quite sure the word I'm looking for is, but you, you know, that's not saying anything against the sort of genital and sexual expression of, of this force, just that it can also be uh, manipulated and reappropriated for like, you know, spiritual development or magical ends. Uh, but that's not to say that there's anything wrong with the, you know, the expression of that force through the, the genital center. And the, those two things, the uplifting of it and the genital expression of it, those aren't necessarily like incompatible. You can, you can have both at once. Uh, all right, yeah, let's just move on here. 
All right, so our yet seratic uh, attribution here uh, is to the zodiac sign of Aries. Now, obviously, that's sort of going out of order um, in our zodiac signs, but that's because of the, the Hezadi switch. So Aries is one of our yang uh, or diurnal signs. Uh, it's a cardinal sign and it's a fire sign. It's the domicile of Mars and the sun is exalted in Aries. So I'll read you some of my uh, uh, keywords here. <clears throat> Let's see, so I've got acceleration, power, friction, impatience, uh, champion, inspiration, immediacy, courage, confidence or even overconfidence, uh, selfish, arrogant, uh, sprinting, um, wanting to prove yourself or prove itself, uh, hot, uh, and also contentious. So all this emerges, I think, pretty clearly. This is one of the, the signs where our different qualities all sort of line up pretty well. Um, you know, it's a it's a yang sign. Uh, you know, so it's expressive and forceful. Uh, it's a cardinal sign, so it's initiating and, and beginning. It's a fire sign, so it's you know it's hot and dynamic. It's the domicile of Mars, so again has some sort of dynamic, hot. Uh, you know, maybe even like, excuse me, uh, maybe even somewhat like aggressive or or confrontational, uh, and then all you know. It, sort of really figures into the, the meaning of Aries uh, and to what, you know, Aries type people are often thought to be like, uh, you know, people who, you know, maybe uh, ap approach life by kind of jumping out into things, you know, sort of like leaping out into the world and then just sort of seeing what you bump into rather than, you know, like planning things out ahead of time first. Um, there can be just to kind of drive to like actively engage with things, uh, you know, and even to sort of bump up against things or maybe have friction with them, but as a way of learning about yourself and about the world. Um, you know, it's a, it's a more active, engaged sort of way of, of being in the world. Uh, yeah, and, it, and it's also the exaltation of the sun, and so we'll see some of that kind of solar uh, significance. It's the first sign uh, in, the, uh, in the zodiac, generally. Uh, this, sometimes cancer is also kind of taken to be the first sign of the zodiac, like especially coming through the Egyptian tradition, but generally Aries is our first sign of the zodiac. All right, so Crowley lists a few magical weapons here. Um, first, he's got the horns. Uh, now, horns have, uh, you know, sort of an obvious connection to the, the ram, uh, you know, which is the, the, what Aries is, is the, the ram. Um, I'm not sure what he envisions as the horns as an actual magical weapon, like something that a magician would actually wear. Um, I'm not clear on exactly what he had in mind there, uh, but the idea of, like, the horns of the ram makes a lot of sense uh, for you know, for, for Aries and for this sign. And of course the ram, you know, fits very well with the general astrological meaning of, of Aries, you know, as, as sort of ramming, you know, accelerating very quickly and then ramming into things, uh, literally ramming. <laughs> right. uh, and then also a magical, also a magic weapon here, um, Crowley-less energy. Now he doesn't get more specific about what he means exactly by energy, but I think if we think about, as we've kind of talked about with some of the other uh, zodiac signs uh, and the magical weapons that they refer to like parts of ritual or to either pieces of temple furniture or to like the preparation beforehand. Um, this could be like the, the magical energy that infuses ritual and that we work with in ritual. Uh, the idea here is that that's being attributed to Aries. Which makes a lot of sense, you know, with, with all the things we just said about Aries as, you know, Mars and fire and, and cardinal, uh, young, you know, all of that stuff, right? This is sort of energy, the, the potency. Um, now, also, uh, we have the burn uh, here for the magical weapons. Did I spell that right? Does burn have two R's? It looks wrong now that I'm looking at it. Uh, there might be a second R there, but I'm not, I can't remember now. Uh, the burin is actually like an engraving tool. And so the main use of the burin here for magical purposes would be like to engrave a talisman, uh, potentially one made of metal, but I think also probably one made of wax um, is what Crowley's thinking of. Uh, and so like the engraving of that thing uh, is, the, you know, the engraving of a talisman to be used in ritual, um, you know, like the imprinting uh, of an image onto something. Um, the burn is also used in at least one, is actually used in ritual uh, at least once by Crowley, and that's in the Mass of the Phoenix. Uh, if you're familiar with that, it's uh, originally from, well, it's from the Book of Lies. It's chapter 44 uh, in the Book of the Lies. And in the course of the ritual, um, you scratch uh, uh, or cut um, 
uh, a sign, uh, basically a version of the NOx sign, uh, into into your chest, uh, and Crowley has you doing this with a burn. Um, burn sort of nice. It, it is sharp, but it's not so sharp to like slice into your chest. It just kind of scratches, and because you really only need like a drop of blood or two uh, in order to do the ritual, uh, so it, it's it's safe to use. Um, and I think it's also interesting to think about the idea that the burn would its normal significant or main significance would be to um, like to the engraving of a talisman. And so by you know having the, the magician use a burn rather than the knife, at least symbolically. I mean, in practice, you might use a knife or something like that rather than actually buy in like an engraving burn. Uh, but the idea is almost like you or your body as a kind of talisman. And so by engraving this sign, you're like engraving a sign into your chest as if you yourself were becoming like a talisman of the force that you were trying to invoke. Uh, I know that was just something I was thinking about in, in preparing these slides. Uh, oh, it looks like we had a couple of comments here. Um, I'm not sure when these came in, so sorry if these are for, uh, to a previous slide. Let's see. Joseph says... Um, Let's see, this is probably not an attribution Crowley had in mind, uh, but the maybe slughorn as a martial musical instrument, uh, like the one from Child Roll into the Dark Tower came by Robert Browning. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with the, the slughorn uh, as a musical instrument, and I, I haven't read that poem. I know that was a, a poem that I know was, was uh, important to Crowley, and he like quotes bits and pieces of it, but I'm actually not familiar with it. So uh, yeah, I'll look that up. Thanks, uh, thanks for that, that Joseph. Uh, all right, let's see, where were we? Okay, right, so for the tarot, um, we've got a two four, uh, the emperor. And again, as I said, this number four uh, definitely takes on some significance with the, uh, with the square um, in the cube. All right, so this is the emperor. And again, I, I mentioned that, that etymological connection between, you know, like the Russian uh, word for emperor, czar, uh, to the, the sound uh, that Zadi makes. Curly makes some other, uh, especially I think, I think in kind of some of his later works, um, he has some interesting lines of uh, like etymological reasoning uh, about different symbols. Uh, yeah, which is an interesting thing to, to look into or to you know, sort of pay attention to maybe more uh, as you're studying Curly. All right, and then we can also uh, attribute the two, three, and four of wands to the three decans of Aries. For perfume or incense, uh, Crowley just gives dragon's blood, uh, and we just saw that as one of the Mars uh, incenses. Um, yeah, and it's especially appropriate here for Aries. You know, it's, it's the, the red color. It has a kind of fiery quality. All right, and then for our magical powers, uh, we have the power of consecrating things. And so I think maybe this ties into what, some of what we were just saying about the burin. Um, consecration is also generally attributed to fire. Uh, you purification and consecration are these two very fundamental uh, like magical procedures that usually are paired. Uh, and purification is associated with water uh, and then consecration with fire. So the purification is, um, you know, making something pure, making it just its, not pure in like a moral sense, but pure in like a kind of chemical sense, making a thing just itself. And then the consecration of something is the devotion of that thing to a particular end. Uh, so we see, yeah, connected to the idea of like the burn to energy uh, and to some of the, the meanings of Aries. I think that, and, and you know, obviously to fire, uh, I think that starts to make some sense. All right, <laughs> really diverse color scale here. Uh, we've got four different versions of red, basically. So again, we've got scarlet, uh, which we just saw a minute ago for, um, uh, for, for Mars. Now we've got it again for Aries. Uh, and of course, you know, in the the twelve fold like division uh, of the color wheel uh, attributed to the zodiac, because uh, you, you're starting with red uh, and then ending, um, you know, and, and going around from there. And so, as the first sign uh, of the of the zodiac, we're starting with this this red scarlet. For the queen scale, uh, we just got straight red. Um, I desaturated that red just slightly, just to kind of make a distinction between. Um, like the, the brilliant flame and then the glowing red. I, I mean, in practice, these are very, very slight, I think, distinctions that we don't need to worry about too much. That they might also be, a, something I was thinking about was that in, maybe, you know, if you're painting an image or something like that, you know, it, it's just a choice of a paint color. But if you're doing visualization um, of color scales, like in the course of a ritual, I think there's a kind of suggestive quality that some of the colors bring in here, like brilliant flame. 
that's suggestive of more than just like a bright red, maybe very slightly orange sort of color, but to actually something about like the quality of that of that force, right? We have like, the idea of like a flame, you know, heat and fire uh, combustion, you know, maybe even like a flickering quality. So I, I think there can be like a kind of a, um, some suggestive uh, aspect to the, the names as well. Same thing with glowing red. Uh, you can't actually render like a glowing red, uh, you know, on the screen here, at least not easily. But if you were visualizing it, you could imagine it as a red that, that's a really, you know, that's a glowing, uh, has a glowing quality to it. And then think about, you know, what that suggests for like the quality of the energy or something like that. But uh, yeah, predominant uh, impression here is, is very much just red. All right, so for our Greek or Roman deity, um, we have Athena or Minerva. Uh, and then also Aries or Mars. You know, Aries or Mars, of course, we we just talked about. Uh, and you know, this is one of the domiciles of Mars. You know, and, and, and as a fiery cardinal Yang sign, it makes a lot of sense for Aries and Mars to be here as well. Athena and Minerva are interesting here. Um, you know, they're here partially as as martial deities, uh, right? And and it's interesting as as you know, female uh, martial deities. Uh, you know, associated with, you know, with, with war, uh, but especially with strategy, um, you know, Athena is very much, you know, she's the goddess of wisdom. Uh, and so, especially like in the Greek tradition, you can really, you know, make a, this strong contrast between like a, the way that Athena fights uh, and the way Ares fights. You know, Athena is all about strategy and cleverness, um, where Ares is just, you know, raw, like brute strength. Um, but there's also another interesting connection in, uh, we talked about Melothesia, you know, the system of attributing, uh, well, the zodiac sign, the planets also, but we talked about the main system of Melothesia of attributing like the 12 regions of the body to the zodiac signs. And so in that system, Aries would be attributed to the head uh, and Athena emerges out of Zeus's head. So you also have this nice, um, uh, you can kind of associate her to Aries through Melothesia, which is also really nice in the part of the body. We also have the Egyptian deity Montu. Uh, Montu is a falcon-headed martial deity. Uh, looks very much like Horus, uh, often portrayed with the sun disk above his head. And I, I didn't include an image of him here. Uh, not an especially important deity. And because he's so close to Horus, uh, I don't know, I, I didn't want to get sort of confusion between those two different gods, but he's another uh, falcon-headed uh, war god. All right, for stones, um, we've got the ruby again, uh, basically for exactly, you know, because of its color again, uh, and because it's the stone of Mars. Um, yeah. Let's see. Yeah. And then for animals, um, we've got the ram, uh, which makes sense. You know, Aries is the ram. And you can really, I, I chose this photo in particular um, of the ram here. Uh, because you can really see the the way the glyph of Aries is like a ram's head and, and the horns, uh, right? So where was it? Yeah, so you can see the glyph there. Um, yeah, and you can really see that that's the, the shape of a, the ram's head and his horns. Uh, also the owl, um, the owl here is, uh, because the owl is is sacred to uh, to Athena or, or to Minerva, um, and you know often it's sort of interesting, owl fits slightly weird here into Aries. Um, you know, owl is often taken as like the kind of the bird of wisdom. You know, because Athena or Minerva is is like the bird of wisdom, uh, and so the owl usually has that type of significance, not really the kind of martial and, and fiery significance that we would associate with Aries, uh, but through Minerva could be attributed to, to Aries. Um, and you'll see that in a lot of literature, um, that the owl uh, as the, um, uh, the, the, the bird, you know, the bird of wisdom or, or the bird of Minerva. You know, Hegel has that very famous line about the, what is it, you know, the, the owl of Minerva takes flight at dusk. Uh, the idea that, you know, sort of philosophy can only understand things like after they've happened or, or retroactively. And so, you know, the owl of Minerva becomes kind of a, a symbol of um, like a philosophy there. All right, and then so for plants, uh, we have the tiger lily. Uh, I think mainly attributed, you know, because of the color there. Um, also, maybe just associate through the association to the, the tiger as well. Um, Curly doesn't give the tiger as like an Aries animal, though I, I think the tiger would sort of make sense um, for Aries. Uh, you know, like like other cats, uh, you know, they're kind of there's a solar. Uh, you know, like we saw, you know, all cats can be attributed to like to Leo um, and to Teth. Uh, and then the tiger, you know, also has some of that 
just you know fiery and solar quality like the lion did, um, but it's maybe even more martial uh, than the lion is. Um, also the geranium, um, in particular, like Crowley references a, a variety of geranium that he was familiar with. That's a very particular kind of brilliant uh, scarlet color. So not all geraniums, but just this one variety of geranium that he had in mind that was the right color. Uh, and then also he, he mentions the olive uh, as, as sacred to Aries. And that's again through Minerva or through Athena since her gift. Uh, yeah, that's how she becomes like the patron of Athens is through the, the gift of the olive, right? Uh, okay, so yeah, I guess we're doing okay on time. Uh, shouldn't go too far over, but let's do our magical hierarchy of Aries here. So again, we're back to another zodiac sign, so we'll see that zodiacal pattern. So two divine names. The first one is the, you know, from the banners of the name, the permutations of the tetragrammaton. Now this one here is, I was thinking about this is a little funny. Um, there's a kind of conceptual, I think, just idea here that needs to be made. So this is yod he vav he uh, but I think this is specifically yod He vav He as one of the permutations of yod He vav He. It's not that the tetragrammaton like in and of itself is being attributed to Aries, uh, but just that one of the permutations of yod He vav He is yod He vav He. Um, and it makes sense sort of as the first permutation, right? You know, Aries is the first sign of the zodiac. This would be the first permutation of those letters, just sort of is those letters in that order. Uh, and then they get rearranged from there. Uh, but just sort of don't get confused and think, oh, you know, why is the tetragrammaton being attributed to Aries? Uh, but yeah, it's really <laughs> yod heh vav as a permutation of yod heh vav -Hey. And I've also given you an alternate divine name, uh, again, the divine name of Mars, uh, This is which we just saw. Uh, and this is Elohim Gibor. For Bria, uh, we've got the Archangel of Aries, and that's uh, Malkidiel. Uh, and then for Yetzera, we've got the yeah, angel ruling the house, uh, that's Ael. Uh, and then the lesser assistant angel in the sign, which is Sarahiel. Now, I want to just draw your attention to Sarahiel. I, I think Sarahiel is probably the correct spelling, um, but I've seen at least some sources, including Eshelman's like seven, seven, six and a half, where he gives Sarahiel, um, where that, that hey there is uh, replaced with a heth. Um, in, in, you can see how that could happen. There could be like a manuscript, uh, a very easy manuscript error because hey and heth look so similar. So I, I believe this is the correct spelling, um, but there is the possibility that hey should actually be a heth. Um, so that's something you can look into. If you were, you know, doing any kind of Aries related rituals, you might want to investigate that and come to your own conclusions about which one is correct. Um, and of course, there's, you know, a lot of research that could be done too in looking into traditional sources for these names uh, that I have not done. All right, and then finally, our Heaven of Saya is just the Hebrew word for the constellation Aries, and that is Tela. All right, so just a couple minutes left here. Uh, we can just spend a couple minutes talking about uh, Atu IV, the emperor, whose esoteric title is the son of the morning, chief among the mighty. So you can really see that red uh, color scales here. Uh, we have a, you know, the immediate <laughs> impression of this card uh, is just the color quality of it, which is really interesting. I, I was thinking about that and, you know, the way that Aries is so, um, I don't know, kind of focused and, you know, the, the symbolism of it, you know, and all the, you know, Mars, it's a cardinal sign, it's a young sign, it's a fire sign, right? Like all of this stuff about initiating and, and beginning and the fiery, you know, kind of power that in apprehending the card, your first impression is just like the raw color as if it were like the raw energy uh, or some sort of very, um, you know, primitive in the sense of like foundational or basic, um, kind of way of, of expressing an idea is just through this pure color quality. Um, okay, now, so now we see the emperor here. Uh, we see some rams in the background. Um, we see the shield with the double-headed eagle there, and we can compare that shield uh, to the empress that we saw uh, a few classes ago. Um, now, also, when we looked at the empress, uh, we saw how the shape that she's making with her body uh, is suggests uh, like the alchemical glyph for salt. And now the emperor uh, as paired with her, um, his body shape suggests uh, the alchemical glyph for sulfur. And so you can see that in, um, 
uh, hopefully you're all familiar with the alchemical glyph of sulfur. It's a, basically just like a triangle, an upward pointing triangle with a cross uh, beneath it. Um, so it looks like a little bit like the glyph of Venus, except instead of a circle at the top, it's a triangle at the top. Uh, and so you can see how his body kind of su suggests that shape. Uh, his legs are, you know, like the cross shape, uh, and then his arms uh, suggest uh, the the triangle on top. So he's like alchemical sulfur uh, it paired with her, the empress, uh, alchemical salt. And then Mercury, as we may have already talked about, hopefully, uh, ooh, the magician uh, in the tarot, tribute to Mercury, is alchemical Mercury. And his posture suggests that as well. So we got, you know, a chemical, a chemical sulfur, uh, which again has all this sort of hot, initiating, beginning, dynamic sort of qualities. Now you can't really see it very much. I was talking about this idea of like the cube or the stone uh, or, or the, the square, um, and you can't really see it so much in this card, but there's a tradition of, of the emperor um, like sitting on a, on a cube uh, or on a cubic stone uh, that is, symbolically significant. And we can think about, you know, the cube and the stone and, and their relationship to like alchemy uh, and to the alchemical great work. Um, that yeah, you, you can sort of look into that, but that's the kind of connection to the four uh, and the idea of the 90 and the 90 degrees. Um, you know, the emperor also as sort of sitting on the, on the throne of the world and like ruling over the world. Uh, there's some of that connection comes in as well. Um, you can see in the scepter he's holding there, uh, he's got the, you know, it's got a ram headed scepter, again, just for Aries. And then in his other hand, uh, he's got this, uh, the globe uh, with the cross on top of it that represents uh, the earth. And so by, by holding this thing, he's representing his dominion uh, over, over earth, you know, over the world, right, uh, as, a, as a ruler, as an, as an emperor. Um, yeah, we also see the lamb there too. Uh, Curly talks about the lamb as one of the animals um, that can be attributed to Aries, though he basically says that it should be, it's, it's not really useful anymore. And that's why we didn't talk about it before. Um, but yeah, the lamb, uh, so in, especially coming through like Christian symbolism um, it is appropriate here. Sort of again, you know, the ram is is connected to uh, like to Aries, of course, right? Or connected to, or sorry, the lamb is connected to the ram, uh, you know, as as the child form of it. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I wouldn't worry too much about the the lamb symbolism here, though. Curly does include it uh, in the in the tarot card. Um, let's see. Yeah, we're just about out of time here. Um, yeah, I think this is, I have a little bit less to say about this card than some of the other ones. I, I think, I know my experience with the card anyways has been uh, very much more about um, there being, a, you know, the, the feeling of like a particular energy or a particular quality to it uh, than such a complex or like detailed like network of symbols and signs like we saw in some of the other cards. Uh, there's something more just kind of expressive about this one, I find. Uh, so I, I have a little bit less to say about it, but I think, it, you know, sort of meditation on it, uh, I think that the qualities of it become very clear. Um, we also see light shining down um, on the emperor from, from above there. Now, in, I think it's in the Book of Thoth, Crowley refers to this, like this light shining down as uh, like the light of Hokma which is a sort of confusion to the old attribution um, uh, you know, of this card to the letter He rather than to the letter Zadi. And so you know, we can kind of ignore that part uh, about Hokma because He uh, connects Hokma to, to Ferith. Uh, so we can sort of ignore that part, um, but still pick up this idea of the light here as like the solar light. Um, and again, you can see another kind of sunlight glyph directly behind him. Uh, and so we see this is like the light of, you know, uh, yeah, the, the light of the sun shining into the card. And of course, uh, the sun is exalted uh, in, in Aries. And so that that makes a lot of sense there. Um, yeah, we're at about five minutes over. So yeah, let's, uh, let's call it a day here. Uh, so that'll, that'll do it for today. Um, yeah, as I said, I'm happy to hang out for a few more minutes if anybody has, has questions and stuff like that. And it looks like one just came in. Um, Let's see, so yeah, so I'll just say, you know, first of all, you know, for more about our work, you can visit tots.org. Uh, you can see our FAQ at tots.org slash FAQ. Uh, there's my email address if you want to contact me directly or if you want to be added to the public Google group. Um, also, for anyone who's not a member of either the academic or the track, we do a $5 uh, suggested donation. 
and you can send that to uh, payments at toss via PayPal to payments at toss.org. So let's see, what was the, uh, Kristen has a question here. She says, what was the quote that you mentioned earlier, the line that Curly quotes from the Chaldean oracles about the hawk? Um, let's see, I can try to find, it's, so God, is he having the head of a hawk uh, whose force is spiral or having a spiral force? Um, I think I can look that up, actually. I, I think I, this is the second time now I've uh, sort of fumbled on remembering that exact line. Um, let's see if I can just Google it. Uh, I know I, I have a translation of the Chaldean articles. Uh, I know a couple on, online. Um, let's see, I'm not finding the one I normally look at. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. You can, you can check out the, in, um, like in Westcott's uh, translation uh, of the Chaldean oracles. Um, you can look at that there, but it's just this idea of, of like God or, or, you know, divinity uh, being uh, sort of imaged as having a hawk head, uh, the head of a hawk. Um, and then, of course, Crowley, like obviously attributes that to, to Horus, you know, and, and to Rahu Kweet. Um, and then also the idea that, that the, the force uh, or kind of energy of the divine uh, is a spiral force. And that those two ideas are connected like in the, in the same verse. That's the, that's the basic idea. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully that answers your, your question, Kristen. Um, uh, yeah, so thanks everybody. Uh, if there are any other questions, uh, you know, I can hang out for another few more minutes uh, or if not, um, That'll do it for the day. Uh, next week, we'll have our last class of this basic format. We've only got four letters left now, so uh, really almost done. So next class, we'll tackle three of them. And then in the very last class in two weeks, uh, we'll look at the very last letter and then do some summary and, and wrap up stuff. So yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, excellent stamina for those of you who have uh, stuck it out for the whole series so far. Uh, yeah, and uh, we can start to wrap up. Yeah, thanks everybody. Um, you know, stay healthy out there, stay safe, and uh, yeah, I hope to see you next week. 93s, everybody. Have a good week.